Hi, welcome to Author's Voice, connecting authors to the world. This is Lit With Love, and I am Meredith Duran, standing in for your host, Sonali Dave, because today we are turning the spotlight on her to talk about her fabulous new release, A Distant Heart. Um, if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, please be aware that you can click a link below the feed and send us live questions, and that you can also buy a signed copy of A Distant Heart as well. Um, so, Sonali, uh, I loved this book. I was gushing to you a little bit about it before we even got started here. Um, I'm a massive fan of friends to lovers stories, especially of childhood friends to lovers stories, which I think is like the hardest kind of romance to write, and you did it brilliantly. Um, and I also came away from this convinced now that it is your USP to put your characters and the readers through an emotional ringer before you give them this amazing happy ending. Um, I was angsting so hard through this book and um, was so elated by the ending. So I'm excited to talk to you about it. Um, before we get started though, I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the book is about and what brought you to write it. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks. <laughs> it's really strange to be on this side <laughs> of, I, I keep wanting to look at the monitor, and I've been told that I'm really only supposed to look at this camera. So uh, thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for joining us. Um, so A Distant Heart is almost um, a sequel to A Change of Heart. <clears throat> so really how it came about, so it is, um, to tell you a little bit about um, the book, It uh, I think of it as, um, a, retell, uh, a retelling of the Rapunzel fairy tale, mm -hmm. almost. Um, and it's, it's basically the story of um, this girl who's stuck in her room, in, 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 an ivory, in her ivory tower, so to speak, um, for 12 years, because she has this rare form of aplastic anemia. And um, the, the only person um, who, um, who she befriends in that time is this boy who's a servant in her home um, and comes in um, to wash windows and do things like that for very good reason. But he's um, almost her eyes to the world uh, for 12 years, and so that's the childhood friendship. And um, when, when a heart transplant comes along um, and, and her cure is tied uh, to that, she's finally let out into the world after... Uh, those 12 years, and all of these um, distances that separate them, Rahul and Kimi, um, become, you know, which were kind of missing in their little bubble where they could create their own world. Um, they, they suddenly have to learn how to navigate those differences. And I feel it's a little bit of an allegory with the, you know, with how society shuts women up in uh, ivory towers, mm -hmm. the whole uh, metaphors for overprotection, mm -hmm. and um, and also the distances between them are you know kind of the distances between us, and so that's that's what the um, the book is uh, about, and where it came from is um, when I started to write Change of Heart, which is uh, the uh, the story of um, these um, Doctors Without Borders doctors, uh, and um, one of so it's a couple, and the wife um, is murdered um, while um, while basically investigating um, an organ black market ring, and so that story was supposed to be about the hero and the woman who gets his wife's heart, and so Kimmy was kind of that girl, but she didn't work at all in that situation because that that book was really about about when you're happily ever after goes wrong and you know having and, and healing from grief and um and and this basically this essentially uh, noble and happy and whole character falling into the abyss of darkness and him coming up so it's it's a healer who loses um you know his uh, his need to heal who basically loses himself because of this tragedy and kimmy although she has all of these challenges mm -hmm. um was a person who is also essentially whole on the inside. So she didn't have the kind of darkness that would pull Nikhil out of his own darkness and kind of resurrect the dead healer inside him. Mm -hmm. So she didn't work for him. And this other girl who was kind of being used and who was a side character who was being used by the bad guys to harm Nikhil had enough of that darkness and she became the natural choice for him. But then I was left with 
Kimmy and her story because she was already there mm -hmm. and this vibrant character and and so that's kind of where so I had to tell the story and Distant Heart is her story and Rahul's story that's where it came from. But you've touched on several questions that I wanted to ask you so I'm going to go back and maybe address them one by one yes. instead of overwhelming you with everything at once. Um, the first thing that struck me, because um, I read A Change of Heart as well and loved that mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Um, kind of read these back to back, actually I reread Change of Heart before I sat down to read A Distant Heart. Um, first, I want to say that this stands alone, although it is a sequel, and that is not easy to do, so brava. Um, uh, the second thing I wanted to say was I thought there was actually a commonality between the two books in the sense that they're both profound love stories, amazing love stories, but they also seem to me to be in many ways, meditations on the, the legacy of trauma, of loss. So, you know, the loss of loved ones through violence. And then I think unusually in the romance genre for Kimmy's case, the, the legacy of chronic illness that, you know, the ways in which that reshapes your idea of yourself and your own potential and, and alters family dynamics, um, et cetera. And um, I wondered, I have to ask about the research and the work that went into this because you did an extraordinary job of inhabiting the psychology of someone who had grown up completely isolated from the world, locked in a sort of sterile environment. And the medical details were incredible, but the psychology of her felt so persuasive to me. I was wondering how you got there. Thank you. That's, that's, that's sweet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that you know, I did the obvious things, which is, um, which is watching documentaries about, um, about there were, I think there were two cases back in the 70s uh, of, um, one was, okay, now I'm going to totally blank out about this. One was um, uh, Danny DeVitro, he was, um, and the other one, I can't remember his name, but they were both almost bubble boys. One went into the bubble uh, at 12, and one was born into it and kind of, passed away at about 10. So I watched as many, and there's a lot of like doc documentaries and a, a lot of, um, do well, some amount of documentation, and I watched that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, there's, um, there's, there's the look in, you know, people's eyes, and you kind of um, try to fall into that. And when you watch it over and over again, which, there, there was that. And then there's this, um, um, there's this, th there's some, autobiographical or memoirs uh, by people who have transplants. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I, I read a lot of those. And I have one of my dearest friends uh, works for Gift of Life Michigan, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, an organ um, donation f facilitating um, organization. And um, she feels very deeply about it. Um, and and um, most of the Gift of Life sites have um, a lot of the family stories and the stories of people, you know, of, of um, people who are waiting in line and, you know. So there's a lot of footage, uh, both um, in, in terms of video and in terms of personal stories and blogs and essays and books about people who've been through chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of that reading. Um, amazingly enough, it's quite uplifting um, as, as compared to my research on change of heart, which was... Um, you know, ha watching this, the same kind of um, exploration from people who've been through um, human trafficking and sexual violence and that kind of thing is, uh, is much more um, hard to deal with for me. So this was, you know, a person who's had chronic illness um, and, and has found light at the end of the tunnel. And it was actually, there were some amazingly inspiring stories in there, but mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of where all of that research came from. And, and I think the way that I research is, um, is, is, is just basically getting really obsessively, you know, ob obsessively watching and reading the same things over and over and over again un until I feel like I've, um, you know, I've imbibed it and kind of fallen into it. And so maybe, <laughs> maybe that helped. And, and then you always tap into, I mean, we don't, ha um, we don't always have um, an exact experience, but we've experienced something that you can kind of almost, um, you know, extrapolate um, toward. And, and that's kind of unfair to the people who've really suffered. But I think as as authors, you can dig into that part, you know, that has either lost or been isolated or been locked up or not had power. And and I think that you know, attaching that 
um, and weaving it in with the actual research is kind of uh, where that might have come from. I mean, I also just think you have an incredible natural empathy. Your characterization is it, book, that's you know, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, above and beyond yeah. Kimmy herself, I mean, at the, one of the reasons this book is full of post-it notes is because, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of like this sort of precise nuanced characterization and you bring that in spades to the point where I would hit a line, I would underline it and say, she's nailed it. She's like hit the core of this character so acutely and like really plumbed their depths. And then 10 pages later, you would go deeper. You were just nice. peeling them away like onion, um, onion layers rather. Um, and so I wanted to commend you on that. You. And also, you know, Rahul is, is catnip, right? He's the strong, oh silent God. type. Yeah. He's survived a great deal, and he's honorable, and he's, you know, completely self-disciplined, and, and obviously I loved him. But Kimmy actually, I think, was an extraordinary accomplishment, right? Because if you have someone who's, who's literally been the Rapunzel story, locked away in a tower, that naivete can so easily become cloying, but in her case, it was a sort of exhilarating thing. And in interesting ways, kind of affecting to watch her go out in the world and deal with some of the mundane realities that we as women, you know, probably first encountered when we were teenagers and have kind of forgotten the trauma of like the amazing interaction with a rickshaw vala who mistakes her friendliness as something more and her sense of uncertainty afterward, her sense of having felt, of having done something wrong. Um, and there's also this like very subtle, I think, um, feminist sort of message that emerges in the way that she encounters this new world and comes to make sense of it through her analysis of Pretty Woman. Um, the I think what should be the famous line, my honor does not reside in my crotch, which she <laughs> yes. says to Rahul at a heated moment. Yes. Um, and I wondered if that was actually part of your explicit conceptualization of, of the character, that, that bringing fresh eyes to this world that had sort of been kept from her for so long, it cultivated this kind of consciousness. Yes, and, um, and first I'm going to step back and say I need to see the underlined passages <laughs> oh gosh, <it'll laughs> because I'm working, on a new, I'm working on a new book and you always feel like, oh my gosh, I suck at this, I should never do this. <laughs> I'm just never writing another book, and so I might need to look at you know how exactly I plumb the word depths. I have a at home. I will send you. because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm not plumbing any depths with the new book yet. <laughs> I'm hoping to, but but uh, coming back to your question, um, I think first um, one of the you know just in terms of depth, um, getting to write childhood for any character, and I think for all my characters, I kind of like to know what their childhoods were. I feel. Uh, very strongly that, you know, and, and this is not, I'm not, this is not like a, you know, big realization, but it's pretty obvious that our childhoods make us, yeah. right? How we were treated, you know, how we learned to, how we learned how, you know, how, how our parents interact with each other. It's, it's all, our childhood is basically the schoolroom of, you know, our adulthood. And, um, and so for any character, even when I'm, you know, reading a book, and I've said this when, you know, we were talking about your book, just to even see a small interaction with any heroine um, watching her parents interact, mm -hmm. or just getting a little peek into their childhoods mm -hmm. enriches a character so much for a reader. Mm -hmm. And when you get to actually write a book which is, which gives almost equal time to their childhood, mm -hmm. I mean, as, um, you know, as an author, that, that was just, fabulous uh, and, and that just gives you um, so much more space to play and and it, it makes it so much easier to just fall into that right so it um, so that was uh, in terms of just craft um, it was lovely to be able to do that um, and, and um, to get to show that and explore it um, as far as the feminist angle uh, I, I, I would like to I mean you said it was subtle but I'd like to believe all my books are almost overtly <laughs> A feminist. Well, yeah, and she did so, not articulate her philosophy on the page and say, I'm a feminist because right, of the experiences right, right. I've had, but it was there constantly. Right, right. And it was part of her resilience, I thought. Yeah, um, and, and I think he is, and I yeah. also like to think my heroes are yeah. feminists, um, as I feel like a lot of men in my family are, mm -hmm. because I will always get the whole, where do you know these Indian feminist men? And I you know whoever says that to me should, you know, come spend some time with my family. So uh, there's, um, so I think Rahul is also very feminist uh, in that he, he's protecting her 
but it's more a professional um, and survival thing for him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so much, you can't do this yourself, mm -hmm. and therefore let me do it for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's more, um, you're under threat, and how can I, or you're suffering, and how can I kind of help you? And he kind of takes his cue from her, and I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, she's, uh, you know, she's, I feel like she's even on a soapbox, not, she doesn't ever, I, I don't think feminists really run around saying we're feminists. No. In fact, we don't really like ever having to justify it mm -hmm. or having to say it, because we shouldn't have to say it, right? I mean, it's time we didn't have to ever say it, and it wasn't even a word, and everybody just was that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so, um, so I think that's what she is. This is what she believes. And, and the wonder thing was definitely, for me, the most delightful part uh, of writing her, because she's almost, almost like this um, rocket ship, right, that's been mm -hmm. pumped full of fuel yes. um, as, um, as, as she's locked up. And she's just waiting to be blasted out on the world. Yes. And so she has so much wonder in everything. Yeah. And um, I mean, right from the start, she has that fa fantastic quote, which made me go, oh, I am settling in for this, where, you know, she is in love with him. He's clearly rebuffing her for reasons she doesn't understand. And she says, well, she could love like that. Therefore, she would love like that. If not him, then someone else. There was a lot of living to be done, 12 years worth of it. I mean, just fabulous. Page 12 already. And I'm just like hooked. I am for this woman. Thank you. <laughs> I should just let you talk. <laughs> I could make a persuasive case for why this is the best book of the year, believe me. Um, but I want to hear, you know, so some of the things you just said uh, called to mind some of the questions I wanted to ask you. We're saying exploring their childhoods. And I think this is what makes a childhood friends to lovers romance so difficult. Because you have to make certain that the reader is there and experiences the weight of what their formative influences were um, to understand the true drama and magnitude of their love in the current moment. And you know, so you used flashbacks for that. And I know in a lot of books, when I read flashbacks, they sort of peter out. And this book is unusual. They go all the way almost to the end. And they were just as gripping as the present day scenes, which is also, I think, pretty unusual in my reading experience. Um, and I wanted to know if you always conceived the book as unfolding that way, or if it was something that you realized you came to as you were writing it that needed to be done. So yeah, so, so the book is structured where it goes um, back and forth in time. So uh, you have a long time ago, present day, a long time ago, present day, in both the points of view for uh, viewers who haven't um, read the book yet. And um, the way I started writing, so it was a bit of a challenge. The, 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 um, the structure of you know, the narrative was a challenge when I started out, because I knew the story. And I knew that it, um, it, it kind of, you know, I knew exactly where it starts, which is when his dad dies. Mm -hmm. Um, his dad shot, and kind of that's what um, you know um, is that that's the seat, um, and and I wrote it almost linearly when I started, or, I, or rather I started out writing it linearly. Although I knew I wouldn't be able to tell it linearly because, you know, um, because a book that starts with childhood and goes straight in in kind of this genre doesn't always work, or I didn't feel like this story would. And often I'll start out telling a story, and I know the whole story, but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to tell it mm -hmm. in terms of, because Bollywood Bride was like that. It was mm -hmm. that their past was really important, mm -hmm. um, and I had to uh, you know, find a way of doing it without doing these backstory dumps. Mm -hmm. and, and so, um, so I knew, I had, since I had done it once, I kind of knew I would figure it out. I just knew I didn't have it yet, and I started to write. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time, I thought what I was going to do is use the device where, um, where I start from, um, from a scene in the present. Mm -hmm. And then I um, kind of, I'm sorry, I start um, yeah, with a scene in the present, then I go to a point, and then fall back and go back. So I had this you know, grand plan, which wasn't, which wasn't working. Because for them particularly, I think that their childhood is, for this story, their childhood is just as important. Yeah. So it doesn't even feel like backstory. It, to me, is a very it's much a story. Romance, right. Thought. Yeah, right. I mean, it was and very much filled with the same sort of angst and fraught tension that one feels in the current moment. It, and and it, isn't it lovely? Like when yeah. you're young, or you know, when, when, you, when you fall in love, when you're starting to realize that one can fall in love is the strong, strongest. I mean, you know, yeah. um, with apologies to my husband, I think that that love <laughs> is um, whom I love very much. But I think that 
you know, the, the kind of, the texture of love that you experience really young. And because of that whole wonder of and that newness mm -hmm. and that ability to just give all of you, you haven't built your shell yet. And, um, and I think there's something so beautiful about, um, about that, uh, falling in love at that age. Um, so, so it was, and for this story, where it ends up in the end, kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it is that linear story from their childhood. Mm -hmm. but, but to answer your question, it was the moment that I realized that I had to do this, um, this back and forth thing, boom, everything fell in place. Yeah. So, and That's you know how, thing. right? Yeah. It's, that, it's that thing and it happens to all writers. I think you know, it's like just, it's just beyond your reach and you kind of want it. And you know, and you know, you have, again, it's like that fuel being pumped and you kind of know something's gonna happen. And as soon as I knew it just after that, it flowed. So. Lovely. I have so many th more things I want to ask and I'm gonna have to discipline myself. Um, so yeah. I, you know, I was looking at um, comments online. I, my favorite thing to do when I finished a book that I love is to go look at all the other kinds of love for the book <laughs> to open up new ways to love the book for me. And it, I was actually really struck by um, comments I saw repeatedly about this book and the last one, that your work is now transcending romance. And I, I get why people say that. I have some theories. But I'm curious about how you would respond to that and what you see as the parameters of the genre that we call romance. So, uh, yeah, and you know, it's, um, I love reading romance. I didn't grow up reading romance. Mm -hmm. I grew up reading, um, you know, reading these pot boilers. Um, you know, I also read classics and the good, you know, and, and the literary stuff. I have to throw that in for my English teachers. But, but the pot boilers, the the Eric Sagals and the Jeffrey Archer and the Sydney Sheldon and Jackie Collins and you know all of that uh, was right. It was just um, it was the the books that you couldn't put down that you stayed up all night reading, right? And um, and and you know keeping a reader up all night is the best possible thing. Edward. <laughs> so, um, so to me, in fact, when I um, took my first writing class mm -hmm. um, at the University of Chicago, and we were all kind of sitting, um, uh, sitting around that table, and we, were, you know, the, the uh, instructor asked us to talk about ourselves and our stories and our genre, mm -hmm. and I said, "What do you mean genre? It's a book." Like I didn't even know what that meant, and I'm, uh, so, so it's then she explained level of idealism it. there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that, yeah, I've been accused of that a lot, <laughs> but um, but so exactly. So, so so then you know everybody tried to explain to me what that was. So you know it was um, it's are you writing romance or are you writing mystery or are you writing you know crime, and I'm thinking you know why does it have to be one, and of course you know ten years wiser, um, and and also when I started reading romance, I had never read single title or or larger romance books simply because. Um, it, it almost felt like when I was um, growing up in India, our exposure mostly was category romance. Um, and, and the first time I actually read a contemporary single title or even a historical, I called my best friend in India and I said, um, did you know that there's like an entire genre that's just love stories? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know. And, uh, and, and I also said to her, and it's exactly like Bollywood films, but in a book. So I think, so I think a lot of it also was because, to me, that felt so so similar because I feel like the structure of Bollywood films or classic Bollywood films. I don't mean, well, any Bollywood films because I was going to say that now they're getting, uh, they're pushing genre boundaries, but then so is romance. No, I totally. I, so, yeah, to is, me is a classic yes. romance novel made I mean, into a film. The closest them, it gets. Um, I think um, Ye Javani Hai Devani, mm -hmm. like all of them, I, I recently, in fact, um, because I was, um, I'm, because I'm revising and my brain kind of stops working at like five o'clock, mm -hmm. and so then I have, to, I fall, fall into the YouTube um, hole, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I went through these three days when I pulled up every, um, so I don't know, I don't even know if you're aware of like the Betab hero, like the really, um, I shouldn't say Betab it. Mother, no, no, Betab is Sunny Deol and uh, Amrita Singh. Sunny to say, yeah. And that's how I. We'll debate this. I was, <laughs> so I was, I was, and I listened to Bollywood music to yeah. kind of, you know, uh, just because I want to do something mindless and fill myself with, you know, the romantic feelings, mm -hmm. and so I'll just kind of fall into that, um, into that um, hole of YouTube Bollywood mo um, video watching. Mm -hmm. 
and and I saw a song with Sunny Deol in it. And I remember being when I was young, when he was, you know, when I was a teenager, I didn't think that you know there was anything special about him. And then I was watching, and I'm like, wow, there's like something very charming. And and I'm talking about Sunny Deol at like in his twenties. So there's something, and 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 Betab, coming back to it, is literally. I mean, this is set in India, and he's a freaking cowboy. <laughs> so, and I mean, like chaps, cowboy boots, yeah. hairy chest. It's hilarious and delicious, and uh, and almost like an old style romance, the kind that you know, that uh, that we love, but that can also be made fun of uh, from way back when. And I think Bollywood films are like that. That there's something so immersive and fabulous about them. But but you know they don't take themselves so seriously that you can't make fun of them. But they're very serious and about the emotion. <laughs> yes. right? I mean, and yes. that's what romance does as yes. well. I and mean, it's aiming yes. to solicit an emotional journey, and yes. I think Hindi films do that really well. We're almost out of time, so I wanted to ask you one question that sort of segues, I think, a little bit off that, which is that, you know, every novelist has to do world building, obviously, and the world building in this book, I think, is an extraordinary accomplishment because you make the Mumbai and the sort of life world of Rahul and Kimi very accessible to people who I think, you know, a lot of your readers in the States probably have never been, have never lived in Mumbai at least. Um, and I was struck again and again by the specificity and the nuance, the, conjure, the, the conjuring of like local politics, Maharashtrians first, the, the presence of the city itself in the novel, you know, the class politics, not just between um, Rahul and, and uh, Kimi's father, but also the household servants and the cross-language jokes, the dude, the dude, like don't call me a milkman. So I was wondering how you went about that, if there were any particular considerations you know, that you had when, because there's no index to the Marathi terms in the book, which I don't think there needs to be. But I was wondering you know, how you go about that. And I get asked that a lot. The truth is that it's my life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm Marathi, I'm Maharashtrian. I grew up in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Bandra, which is the suburb where this book is set. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'd love to say oh, it was research and it was hard and it was hours and hours of contemplation. But it's really, it's who I am. This comes absolutely, and, and that's why own voices is so mm -hmm. important. I mean, can you research this and can you write something um, that uh, will probably be even more authentic than this sure but i think that 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 gut level uh that that gut level um connection with the place mm -hmm. uh, and with the nuances of the place are you know th it's just in there like when i'm visualizing rahul he is uh, you know he's from a specific kind of community within the community mm -hmm. his um his life experience is that of boys i've met mm -hmm. who have had that exact uh, life experience. Mm -hmm. And of course you em embellish because he is Rahul, he's not those other guys. And the same thing with Kimi. It's just, it's it's absolutely gut level and it was, um, and naturally I love Mumbai. Mm -hmm. I was, um, I, I've, I'm almost at that point where I've lived in both countries for the exact same amount of time, but I've spent my- I appreciated my the Costco reference yeah. book as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, see, I, and <laughs> That's own voices too, <laughs> yeah. but, but um, I was. I mean, you know, really, the home you grow up in is just home. Like you'll always say you're from California, right? And so, um, so, so no one can tell me how I should see Mumbai. That's the other thing. I have such strong ownership mm -hmm. that if if a reader says, "Well, this doesn't, this is not the Mumbai I grew up in," mm -hmm. that would not phase me because I am absolutely one hundred percent certain of the Mumbai I grew up in and how that feels and what that, uh, you know, what that's like. And you have masterful expertise in making it accessible to the rest of us who might not have spent much time there. Okay, you have many shout outs on Facebook I need to share. Um, from Smitha Praveen, um, from Sylvia, um, Anne Falguni, Joanna, and others all give you many likes, much love. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, I, we, you know, we've gone through so much of this interesting stuff. The last question, very quickly, can you define alpha hole? Can you define bleeping <laughs> with your heart? And can you define porno music? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I knew this was coming. This is all thanks, Vicky. That's our <laughs> producer. <laughs> so, um, oh my God. <laughs> so, so these are terms I've used on the show as a host. <laughs> 
<laughs> and 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 Vicky is now um, using them to um, get me to trip up a little bit. But um, so what is it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I love to say uh, when people ask me about uh, sex scenes in my books, um, I, I, um, I love to say, well, you know how I, I naturally don't believe that the love scenes are gratuitous and all of that. But really the best way to say it is that I think my characters um, fuck with their hearts. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and Excellent. so, um, which is, and then I have friends who say very classy, Sonali. So <laughs> that's my classy definition. And so we were bleeped out. So we were, I wasn't supposed to actually say fuck. I was supposed to say bleeping with hearts. And so I guess so they, that's what bleeping with hearts is. They don't bleep to porno music. Is this <laughs> they, no, this? they do bleep with their hearts. The porno music was a question that I asked Kristen Higgins when she was here. <laughs> Because she uses the term porno music in uh, her book, um, in, in her <laughs> book now that you mention it. And I, I was reading it and thinking, what is porno music? And so I asked her, <laughs> and everybody here was, you know, rolling their eyes, oh, Sonali doesn't know what porno music is. <laughs> like, I think we're watching different porn. <laughs> so, because online porn has no porno music, but anyway. TMI. That was that. <laughs> I am extremely <laughs> thrilled with that answer. Thank you. Um, so we are reaching the end of the time that we have for this live broadcast. We have been talking about A Distant Heart, which is uh, 1595 from Kensington. Thank you, Kensington, for making Sonali available today. And please do buy a signed copy from Sonali while you have the chance. Um, I also want to say that coming up soon on Author's Voice, um, A House Divided on February 2nd at 5 p.m., with Timothy Roberts uh, in his new book, the, This Infernal War. Another Lit with Love with your host, Sonali Dev, uh, February 9th at 5 p.m., we believe, with Falguni Kotari's latest, which Sonali is raving about, um, My Last Love Story. And finally, Solved, February 22nd at 3 p.m., with Melanie Benjamin's The Girls in the Picture. Um, and you are watching, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can still order signed books by clicking the button below the link or going to the website. Thanks for joining us.